challenges of clinical trials. So, um, okay, so I've been asked to talk about uh, a whole bunch of uh, er uh, areas that happen out there when you do a clinical trial. And uh, we'll go over some of this stuff fairly quickly. And I'd like to just uh, thank again that uh, this is um, run by the Working Group on Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy. I want to recognize that these courses have been supported by an unrestricted educational grants from Amgen, uh, Daichi, Sankyo, and Pfizer. And uh, now what? Yes. Okay, so when you're running clinical trials in 2017, this is sometimes as how it feels. This is from the New Yorker, and uh, that's our uh, investigator or sub-investigator with the stuff involved. But uh, my plea is just to show you that that's how it feels. It's worth doing because clinical trials have changed the way we practice medicine. And the, I'm giving you some examples in my time uh, as a cardiologist that uh, since uh, consensus one in the 80s showed that you can have a 40% risk reduction of death uh, in uh, heart failure within six months. And then we showed later on in 2001 that uh, you can uh, have a 20% decrease in event rate by adding clopidogrel to aspirin, means the onset of DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy, 2001, this is the original slide Salim Yusuf showed at the ACC in Orlando, March 20, 2001. And then we, in 2009, we have the Rely paper, and where we showed that not only do you have non-inferiority of the dibigotran and OAC versus warfarin, but on the high dose of dibigotran, 150 twice daily, which it should be the dose of dibigotran, according to the United States, Mark, and quite correctly, which gives you superiority to warfarin. Uh, and then there are other drugs that have come since then, and... Uh, then, um, more recently, we, in the field of diabetes, where we thought we should have shown non-inferiority, all of a sudden we see it depends on how you control your blood sugar and your diabetic patient uh, in terms of mechanisms of action of drugs. And there's some drugs that actually confer benefits on prognosis. So clinical trials are really worth doing. And uh, we should ask ourselves some questions is, how did these trials show that? Because in each case, the objective was relevant and important. Don't waste time on uh, doing a clinical trial and finding uh, your blood uh, uh, um, beetroot level. Uh, it's more important here, the questions that were asked. Do ACE inhibitors improve survival? That was the basis of consensus. Is DAPT superior to aspirin alone? Well, now there's a lot of discussion going all ways on this area. Uh, is the bigger trend non-inferior or superior? Straightforward, in clinically important questions. Can the antiglycemic drug choice impact on long-term outcome? So that's why we do clinical trials. Now let's get to how it's done in the field. Well, I'm going to go through all the players. Again, you probably all know this. If so, just bear with me. We're building the discussion of the program as we go from topic to topic. Um, I'd like to make a few points of the way that I would give from my observations as a clinical trialist of uh, uh, several years now. Um, where I come from, um, everybody wants to be a PI. Uh, they also want to be the prime minister, by the way. But, uh, but uh, in, the, in the trials area, they want to be PIs. What they don't always realize is the responsibility of a PI. The PI should be an MD with trial experience. He is the lead scientist for a project as a laboratory study or a clinical trial. And the PI, which I'm going to talk about, is at the site level, but there's also a national PI, which has different functions, how to keep a country running in the present era of international collaboration. So uh, particularly at the site area, please remember the PI, when you're the PI, you're responsible for the preparation, the conduct, the administration of the trial, and basically everything that goes in the trial, whether you sign it or not, when something goes wrong, it's you. And uh, that means you should check that their consent forms are signed properly by the team, check that the CRFs are done, all the reporting, if you don't report an SA within 24 hours, the, the coordinator's not to blame, the PI's to blame. Um, you need to be available, and basically you have to do everything you can to make sure that the trial is conducted without GCP violations. In other words, exactly according to GCP. Because when there's an audit, and in the United States or in Europe it's become fairly uh, um, uh, 
common to have FDA and EMA orders, the better we do in the results, the more suspicious people get, quite justifiably. I mean, if you look at the Impareg, the results are so impressive, the question is, uh, were the data genuine? So uh, I'm sure they were. But I think you, one has to be realise that the PI is going to be checked very carefully with a magnifying glass. And then who do you have in your team? So you need some good staff, some investigators who belong to your staff. They may be staff cardiologists, residents or trainees will come to it in a minute. In our country, everybody has to have GCP certificate, else you cannot be in a trial. And you also have to have updated uh, GCP certificates only in the last two, uh, two to three years. And you have to have a delegation in the role in the trial exactly what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. The coordinators, we have the nurses, we have bias te uh, technicians, you may have social workers, but they each have to be well-defined what they're going to do. And then you need administrative and secretarial support. Now, here's an interesting concept. What is in the trial? If you're running a department and you're doing clinical studies that are multi-center, multinational, whatever, with the way we do trials now, like uh, Fourier, um, Residents and trainees. Now, there's a very interesting discussion you could have here. Because if you're a cardiology fellow, uh, the advantage of being in clinical trial arena, as a, we have a group called Cardiovascular Pharmacologists and Trialists of Tomorrow, which I think maybe some of you belong to and are helping us develop. But if you, that's great because you get very quick access. You start your specialization in cardiology within a few weeks or a month you know exactly what's going on, the state of the art in a certain era, where you've been thrown into it, at, as they say in a swimming pool, at the deep end, you have to start swimming. And you will meet top investigators and lecturers. You will see uh, at a meeting, well, probably not now, but I, I suddenly said once, there was Gene Brownwald. Uh, you know, I think that uh, I was uh, more scared to uh, meet this guy than I would be if I had to meet uh, God in heaven. I mean, there was Brownwald right there and talk, giving talks. So it's a big advantage. You get contacts, you get ahead. And you learn all about what's protocol, I have all the research things. But the di problem is you do not have time for independent thought because your boss tells you, uh, yeah, that's right, maybe we should have done it differently, but it's too late. That's the protocol. You can't change it. Stop asking questions. Uh, that's what... I know it was, I had a lot of people in trials. And then you've got less time available for your own independent research because you're so busy doing the trials that the department or the institution is doing. And also less critical questions, as I've said. Eventually, you, I might tell the, my research fellow and say, look, you know, just do as you're told. Stop asking questions. I can't like this. Every day we've got all these patients. This is a very bad message for a, a, a fellow in training. You're supposed to say, ask questions, make new ideas. It's a disadvantage. And then the publication problem is huge at every level. University professors down to the most junior guy. Because what do you get for your CV when your appointment in your medical school is at stake? Where are you? There's only one guy who's going to be the first author of the paper. It will be like uh, for Furia Mark Sabatine. Uh, so where are all the guys who do all the work? Uh, at different levels, they're listed somewhere, and I'll check it. I know people who was my research coordinator. You can Google her. She comes up. She's listed somewhere in a list of 1,000 people at the end of the trial. But when you're looking for an academic appointment, um, that counts in our medical school. Now they've had a new category in the CV to show that you're collaborative, you're a good citizen, you can work with them. But it's like the last in the list of credentials. The best would be if you're writing the paper. Okay, so this is some aspects of clinical trials. Now, we already heard about it. You've got to have the facilities. We can go through that quickly. You've got to have the patients. Alexander Nissen already talked about that. Don't promise to do a study and then find you don't have patients because the uh, world of uh, modern electronics remembers that. And when you uh, approach for a new trial and you say, what did you participate in? Well, nowadays they don't even have to ask you. The companies who are sponsoring the trial or the CRO or the principal investigators can look up your track record. And you, it's written there that in the previous study in this area, you recruited one patient, whereas uh, everyone else recruited 30 patients, then you are not going to make a good name for yourself. So only commit to do what you think you can do. Um, you have to 
have electronic communication. This is very challenging. I mean, this is very boring stuff to talk about. I'm dying to talk about lipidology, which we'll come to later. But please know, if you're PI, you have to make sure everything works. It's time consuming. You argue with the IT guys in your hospital. We cannot get our uh, machines past the firewall. The, uh, we can't get the data. The, the, things don't work. The, uh, the, the security don't let us put, complete the CRF. And again, it's like the Americans said, the dog ate my homework. It doesn't matter to the guys sitting, say, in, in the Timmy group in Boston or in the Duke group in Duke that uh, Basil Lewis promised that he can't complete a CRF. He's always three months behind because his computer can't connect. You just look bad. So it's a lot of work to get things running properly. You have to conform to records. You have to lock everything up. You know, the key's in the lock because otherwise you wouldn't <laughs> see it. All the patient's data has to be coded and safely, safely uh, stored. And uh, these are uh, all drugs, temperature logs, daily, 24 hours a day, you keep your stuff. This is uh, Evolocumab, it really is, uh, from the Fourier trial when we had it in our uh, fridges. Temperatures alarmed. On a weekend, you, as a PI, I get my, my phone going now. Well, it's finished, the but it could have happened. Uh, there's an alarm that your, your temperature's changed in, the, in your drug storage in your hospital. And I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do about it while I'm giving a talk here in a meeting with all you great guys in Vienna. But there's a lot of responsibility in running trials. These are all the things involved. You have to have the equipment to centrifuge the blood and stuff like that. You may have to store it. This is minus uh, 79. It should be minus 80. Uh, you may have to ship bloods. These are all the things that go into clinical trials. You need a well-maintained and equipped uh, office complex. Don't please make sure that this is one of the main pieces of equipment in your office. What about the ethics committee? Come to more serious stuff. The ethics committee, the IRB of the Helsinki committee has an extremely important role. Uh, it's a very good sparring partner. If you want to go and do fencing against your ethics committee, this is what it feels like. But these guys are extremely important. There was a case about three years ago, which you guys will remember, I'm sure, uh, where somebody in France did a study on uh, a, st a drug that was supposed to improve cognition, and um, the patient ended up, uh, to put it into the words of the lay press as a vegetable, and uh, uh, the first thing that happened was the investigator, it's clearly everybody says, who did that? And the ethics committee here saves your life because uh, what you have to show in that case is something that was une unexpected. Something goes wrong. Um, it's, it could happen. That was a, the worst example maybe, but when something goes wrong, be, we need the ethics committee to protect us as the investigators more than ever. And the ethics committee was done according to the book. It had scientists, researchers, experts in the field of the study, pharmacologists, pharmacists that we have in our ethics, institutional administrators. How does the trial fit into your hospital program? Public representatives, how does the public see it? Legal opinion, uh, a lay lawyer, not sort of medical legal expert. Uh, if you're doing the study, what does it mean for the person participating and how might it affect uh, perception? So the ethics committee are really very important and uh, their role is really to defend the investigator, but make sure everything is done, to monitor the trial, to see how you're getting on, are you using the right language, are you signing your forms properly, and to watch out for everything that could possibly go wrong. When you do the trial, also, the first thing you do is identify the patient and sign informed consent. You're not allowed to do anything until uh, you have ethics approval, I should have said, and signed by the, uh, your institution director, you cannot start, you cannot even, you cannot open the drugs until you have an approval. And when you do the study, you cannot do anything with the patient until he's signed an informed consent point and you've explained to him, do it correctly. The commonest error that the FDA report and an audit, the commonest finding that makes a, uh, a comment against the site or investigator is your informed consent forms were not done properly. I cannot see why this is difficult because there's a line that says, I explained this to the patient, explained to the patient, signed, the patient signs it and puts the date, writes his own name, and then the investigator signs it. For some reason, people can't do that. And you're not allowed to take blood from the patient. You're not allowed to do any test, even a cardiograph, really, connect him to an EKG, which was not for his own health, 
It was for the sake of research if he has not signed the form beforehand. And in this day, it's a nightmare because there comes the auditors and they say, we had this, really happened to us. That the guy said, but how, this, I'm checking it. An auditor looked at the time the informed consent would had a date and time. And he said, but here's the EKG. It was, an hour, it was before the informed consent form. And we had explained to him that it was, we couldn't figure it out. So we suddenly remembered that the time and the EKG was out of phase because they changed from summertime to winter time. The clock changed or something. And these little things make me crazy. It's so stupid. But uh, I guess that if we want to, what I said before, we want to be protected and do things properly for the benefit of science and the benefit of our patients. There have been so many mistakes made, not by people in this room, but huge, major, big investigators have done things wrong. There's been fraud, there's been everything. So we're being punished in a way, and we have to do all this stuff. Okay, when you do the study, please follow the protocol. My first teacher in epidemiology was a guy called Kurt Lupsen from Rotterdam. He actually once uh, said, I've never yet found a physician investigator who's actually read the protocol. And even the guy who writes it has only written a piece of it. And you know something, I think he's probably right because I don't even know anyone in this room has ever read a protocol from A to Z, everything in it was so boring. <laughs> and uh, even if you don't read every word, please carry out according to the protocol. There are so many reasons why that should be done. Uh, Remember to integrate the trial. We've just been checked by the, uh, uh, for accreditation in our hospital. You must have everything in the patient's medical records. It must be stated in the trial what the trial's about, where the investigate can be reached. When the patient comes to the emergency room with a fractured femur and he says, I'm in a clinical trial, the staff there who have no idea who the, our study is about need to know whether this guy's getting a lipid lowering drug or an anticoagulant can, when, they, when this patient needs a surgical procedure. So it all has to be done properly.